it's funny too. Here's another one. You have people aim for a gallon of water a day and they just eat less yeah. as a result of it yeah, because they're not, about that before. Yeah, because they're not as thirsty. But I know it sounds funny, right? Don't drink while you eat and you'll lose weight, but it's true. <clears throat> yeah. And it's behavior based. Wash behind your ears. Yeah. So instead of telling someone, cut your calories by 10 or 15% and they have to track, yeah. don't track your calories. Just don't drink while you eat. Watch what happens. And people end up eating less. Oh, I got a great giveaway for you today. Um, I put together two MAPS programs that require minimal to no equipment. So those of you that like to work out on the go or work out at home, check this out, right? So here's the giveaway. MAPS Anywhere. All you need for that program is your body and some resistance bands and MAPS Suspension. All you need for that program are suspension trainers. So both programs can be done with minimal space, great results, and I'm going to give both of them away for free but you got to do this to enter to win, right? Leave a comment the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. It helps us with the YouTube algorithm. Also subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. Do all those things. And if we like your comment, we'll notify you underneath that you won free access to Maps Anywhere and Map Suspension. Also, big sale going on in the month of March. We combined Maps Strong with Maps Powerlift in the Power Bundle. So Maps Strong is a strongman-inspired workout program. MAPS Powerlift is pure powerlifting style workout program. So both programs together normally retail for $300, but right now in the Power Bundle, $79.99 gives you full access for life to both programs with this particular sale. So it's massive, all right? So if you're interested, head over to mapsmarch.com and get signed up. All right, here comes the show. Are you having trouble burning body fat? Stop drinking water while you eat. What? <laughs> I know. <laughs> Stop drinking water? Yeah. Okay, so one of the uh one of the most profound Sounds things like an influencer challenge. that I learned, yeah. I know, yeah, yeah. as a trainer and you guys know this, right? As a trainer after years and years was to start to train and coach people based off of behaviors versus the mechanistic actions of things like fat loss and strength mm. training all that stuff, right? And one thing that really influences our behaviors in a way that gets us to eat more food is to drink water while we eat because it prevents us from slowing down and fully chewing our food. And I'm speaking from personal experience. I figured this out because I was having, I, you know, you guys know I struggle with gut issues here mm -hmm. and there. And right now I'm doing great, but it's sometimes it's bad. Sometimes it's good. And I remember the past I had all these gut issues and I had a gut health specialist tell me, you need to chew your food more. Mm -hmm. Try that out. And I said, well, I do chew my food. And they said, well, do you drink water while you eat? And I said, yeah. And they said, stop drinking water while you eat and then see if you need to chew more. And sure enough, I had to chew way more and it did help my digestion. And then I realized it takes me way longer to eat the same amount of food. And so I started communicating with this to clients and studies actually support this. Studies show that when people chew their food fully, they eat like 10% less calories than if they wash it down with water and stuff their face. We all should listen to grandma. Yeah, I mean, that's <laughs> chew really your food, what it damn it. Chew your food. Chew your food. <laughs> ah, seriously though, it's such a like a I don't know, like it, it seems stupid and, and simple and but it's it same experience with me. Like I didn't even realize and I think you're just like in your own way. Like you're you're just constantly doing what you're going to do during the day and like I would just drink with my food because it was, you know, whether I was rushing off to something or whether I, that just became a habit of mine where I would just wash it down. I felt like every huge bite I was taking I had to wash it down. Yep. Didn't realize I was taking massive bites all the time became like a real problem for me in my digestion and then was getting in the way of me progressing uh, you know, in, in the gym. So I acted surprised when you said it, but the truth is I think we've all at one point uh, messed with this. And I think the thing that it is, <clears throat> it's just another example of how distracted we are when we eat Yeah, yeah. Uh, on your phone. We've talked about that before about getting off your phone or don't watch TV. And I think Justin, you hit it right on the head. I think, and I think that's what everybody is doing. I think everybody is just racing to get the next bite in and you just subconsciously you start to piece together that oh when i take a drink after i take a bite it flushes it down faster so i can get to the next yeah. one and you just don't even think twice about it and then it just becomes a habit and behavior that you do always when you eat and simply interrupting that and saying hey you know what i'm gonna sit down and have a meal and i'm not gonna have any drinks with me while i do it i mean just makes you become hyper present because you like you said Sal, you have to chew it like 30 more times it's to get it down. It sounds silly. I know it sounds silly, but I swear to, and studies, again, they support this. It's about 10 to 15% more calories 
when we eat rushed or we eat fast or we eat distracted. And, you know, digestion starts in the mouth. That's the right. Digestive, That's part of the process. It is. And liquefying your food is very important for a couple of different reasons. One, it breaks the food down into smaller pieces, which has a larger surface area to mass ratio, meaning it, it's it's easily digestible, right? It's much more easily digestible. You are you get more access to nutrients. Because the process is slowed down, you have more time for the signal from the gut to get to the brain that says, hey, we're eating. You don't need to eat as much. So your hunger starts to drop. Yeah, you get more satiated. Though. Yes, absolutely. And I got into this habit because as a trainer, I'm sure you guys did this too, in between clients, I would have my meals, right? This is when I would eat six, seven meals a day. And I'd have, you know, one client finished, next client's warming up for 10 minutes on the treadmill. Or I'm I'd driving to my next one, just like trying to pound it down. Totally. And then when I had to slow down, I'm like, man, I have to, ch I really have to chew, especially meat. I got to chew. You have to liquefy it in order for it to work. But once I did that, my digestion got better. And again, once I had clients do this, it was funny too. I, I experimented this way. I'd tell clients, I'd say, I want you to try this out. I'd say, don't drink anything while you eat. And they say, what about water? There's no calories. Say, no, no, no. Even water. Don't drink while you eat. Just let's just do this for a second and see what happens. And after a few weeks, they would lose like three, four pounds and they'd be blown away. And then of course they would think that there was something that had to do with the, you know, is the water, you know, ba uh, you know, making the it imbalance with the acid in the stomach and the food or something weird. It's like, no, 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 you're just eating less yeah. <laughs> because yeah, you're not watching. You know what I haven't tried that might be a decent strategy is actually to, you know, drink a whole glass of water before you eat and then no water while you eat. Yeah. Mm. Uh, probably a good strategy. I used to tell clients that to help, you know, because uh, a lot of times we're, when we think we're really hungry, a lot of times we're just thirsty. Yes. We're hydrated a little bit. Yeah. Right? That's a good point. So having a glass of water like that to kind of fill you up a little bit and then also not drinking it all while you eat probably Probably a pretty good strategy for a lot of people. Yeah. So in Ayurvedic medicine, and I, I'm, I hope I'm getting this right, um, I did have a friend that was an expert in Ayurvedic medicine, and they do talk about balancing liquids with uh, solids, and they, in, in the way they communicate it is different, but it's something to do with balancing out the acids in it's your like stomach. Hot foods and colder. Yeah, and, and profile and foods. He used to say, drink a full glass of water 30 minutes before you eat. So he would say 30 minutes before, drink a big glass of water. Yeah. Then 30 minutes later, eat your meal. Don't drink any water while you eat your meal. And then wait a little bit before you drink more water. That was what they said. Now, I'm not an expert in Ayurvedic medicine, so I don't know what the rationale is there. But what you said, Adam, I think makes perfect sense. As far as thirst and hunger goes, um, that's 100%. I would have clients. It's funny, too. Here's another one. You have people aim for a gallon of water a day and they just eat less yeah. as a result of it yeah, because they're not, about that before. Yeah, they're not as thirsty. But I know it sounds funny, right? Don't drink while you eat and you'll lose weight, but it's true. <clears throat> yeah. And it's behavior based. Wash behind your ears. Yeah. So instead of telling someone cut your calories by 10 or 15% and they have to track, yeah. don't track your calories. Just don't drink while you eat. Watch what happens. And people end up eating less. Well, let's, um, let's talk about more things we're not experts in. Um, <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> I love when we do that. <laughs> Great. Uh, the executive order just recently came out um, that uh, the government is uh, full on getting into cryptocurrency. Did I read that correctly? Uh, okay. So there's discussions to for an executive order that will uh, encourage the creation of a digital currency, like an official government digital currency. Is so that's anybody the else concerned about this? Or is I it know, just dude. me? I don't like it. I all. actually predict that this is going to get Biden reelected. <clears throat> this is my theory. Okay, so if they go, do this, okay. if we let's, actually get a, a let's digital hear currency. Yep. So my theory is what we have. Okay. Well, everybody knows what's going on with inflation. It's getting crazy. Now we have, uh, you know, a war that's going on right now. We've just heard that sanctions. We're, we've just heard potentially that we're going to be printing more money. We all see what's going on with gas prices. So everything's going insane. So you have a, a ton of people that are, are struggling right now. They're living paycheck to paycheck. The, the gas. To get 64%. Your I just read that 64% of Americans right now because of inflation are living paycheck to paycheck majority. So my theory, if this goes, if the executive order goes through, if they do create a government uh, cryptocurrency, then the very next thing that happens after that is Biden is going to come to the rescue and put out a UBI via cryptocurrency for, you know, they'll figure out a, you know, price point or I mean, uh, income point, right? So if you make under, say, $60,000 mm -hmm. a year, you will get a, you know, $1,000 worth of cryptocurrency, which can be used for 
these things at these places. And I think he, I think everybody is going to be excited about it. I really, of course, you're going to have the few people that I will wish see you were wrong. I, right? You know, I just remind, it reminds me of like the kid runs for fifth grade, fifth grade president, and they're yeah. like, you know, elect me and we'll get 15 yeah. more minutes for recess or we'll have free pizza. We on have free Wednesday. soda for everybody. <laughs> yeah, and everybody's like, yay. Yeah. Uh, so, because you know what solves inflation? More inflation. Yeah. No, you know, okay. So, um, I have an issue with this for, for a couple of reasons. Well, first off, I don't, I think UBI is a great idea so long as we eliminate other welfare programs because the bureaucracy that exists to administer all the welfare is such a waste of money that if we got rid of that bureaucracy, it's like you're talking about tens of thousands of, of federal employees that are there just to administer all these different programs. You got rid of all that and you just gave people money, you would save taxpayer dollars. And I think you'd have people spend money terribly, but you have some people that would use it in good ways. My issue is with the digital currency because that means that they would get rid of paper currency. Right. That means no coins, no paper, no nothing. And now we're giving the same entity that, you know, you know. It bought. makes sense though. I mean, with the uh, infrastructure there where they've already tested UBI with certain areas uh, and had some successes and whatnot to then roll in, you know, well, let's see how the cryptocurrency would would fare uh, in that situation. Well, well by they, doing it that way, they just can control so much more. They well, it's, would, a, it's a slow drip. First right? of all, they would make all other cryptocurrencies illegal. Very illegal. Yeah. It would be relegated Bitcoin to the black market. We like banned. No competition whatsoever. We have the digital currency. Oh, you you think so? 100%. 100%. They're no, going to snuff out all other No way. So maybe it'll eventually go that way, but I think that the way it would roll out first is that it would it would work in conjunction with or Oh, they wouldn't ban it outright. Yeah, yeah. 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 But right, they would. right now it look it would look more like food stamps, just digi a digital version that they, they can control. They want to buy you in first, but uh, honestly the scary part to it all is just the limitations and access that uh, the government would then be able to basically program in what you're able to buy with that type of currency. And they have the ultimate say of what you do with your money. Well, I mean, okay. So they would, I think hundred percent, they would get rid of other cryptos because they want no competition. Number two, remember this is the same entity. And I hate saying this because it sounds like, uh, you know, someone's gonna be like, Oh, you're a conspiracy. No, no, this is legit. Like we're talking about the same entity that, uh, bombs countries under false pretenses. We've, we we just got out of a war or a couple wars that were kind of based on some of that, like Iraq, for example. The same entity that can legislate, that creates executive orders that go around the Constitution, that has done some pretty weird shit that can throw you in jail if they want. Now they have complete control of money, 100%. So they could literally say, Adam, uh, you know what? We're not going to let you spend money on anything except for food and, and housing, and that's it. You're done. Or they could say, we're going to freeze all your stuff. You get nothing. You can spend nothing. And if anybody spends money for you, they'll go to jail, and we can track everything. So I, it's, a bit, you know, it's a bit it's Out a bit of scary. us, I'm the, I'm, I'm the least fearful of the scary power moves of that, although I, you know, I'm not completely like not a, <laughs> worried about I'm just not as afraid about that as I really think this is just a, a – power grab, money grab, slash uh, benefit the elite while we pretend we're helping the, you know, uh, you know, poor. It's yeah. not, that's the part that I think that, that well, here, cause it'll sound really good to the majority, right? The majority will go right as we're, does. as we're all starving and having a hard time at the pump. Everyone's going, oh my God, what are we going to do? Inflation is running out of control. It's not going to slow so down. What I money? wish people did was actually watch videos specifically of what comes out of these elites mouths. Like, so the world economic forum. Oh, I saw that. If you guys could just please do me a favor. If you're listening to this, to Google that, to just watch videos and see like what, what a they lot actually of this, said. Yeah, what they actually came out of their mouth in yeah. terms of like reprogramming human beings. Yeah, it's really weird. I I, it's, I wonder it's trippy. Where are they gonna store this? So here's the here's the thing, right? Are we gonna store this in our normal banks or are we gonna store this in government, new government type bank, right? Like a wallet. Right? Like a wallet, right? Um that would make me a little bit uh, wary. Um, well, of course, and then that means they could tax you very easily. Oh, you know what? Uh, we need more taxes on, I don't know, the wealthy. Well, so you, you're, you're thinking, I think maybe I'm thinking potentially years in advance. Yes. I'm thinking like the immediate, like this is what's going to get Biden reelected and what's mm. going to happen. Oh yeah. Right? They'll sell the shit of it. Right oh, yeah. now it's yeah, going to people free money. We're not going to get rid of money it's right now. Thing. We're not going to shut down other cryptocurrencies right now. The initial move is to do it as a way to support and help people mm. that 
are in need or that are struggling to get by. And so they will push out this, this, this currency, this digital currency that you'll, and just like food stamps, you'll only be able to use it for certain things. And you'll, based off of the income that you make, you'll get, and a lot of people are going to be very supportive and excited about yeah, this. You're, you're, you're probably right. Yeah. I, I, I would agree that yeah. that's, of course, they're going to sell it, you know, really well. Now, now what, how are they going to, how would you get rid of the dollar, right? I don't think they could get rid of the dollar unless the dollar became worthless. So, and, and again, again, here we go. Let's, let's go down this path a little bit. If I were to write a script. Yeah on how to destroy the value of the dollar, the last few years would be- devalue the dollar? It would be perfect. Like, you just print more, print more, print more, create more inflation, create more instances of, you know, where we need to- Get yourself in a war, cause more uh, yeah. need for money. And then the dollar's like worthless, and then they come with the rescue with the new, you know, what are they going to call it, by the way? Biden yeah. bucks? <laughs> <laughs> I no, know. I don't think we're, I think we're still a ways away from uh, eliminating the Control dollar. coin. But I, <laughs> I do think that this is going to Bald give, give the government an even larger foothold. And I think people are going to do it and be excited about it. I think that's the scary part. I think the scary part is that it's going to get presented to people as huge relief and help. And it's going to seem like a no-brainer. If you're somebody who's struggling like that, where yeah. your, your gas doubling in price right well, now literally may, means you might not be able to pay your rent, and all of a sudden Biden comes out and says, hey, listen, if you're at this income level- and what if it's dude, a People discount? are hanging on a string. Like, what'd you say, 64% yeah. of uh, paycheck, to paycheck. paycheck to paycheck? And what like, if it's a discount? What if, what if it does this? Like, yeah, you can still buy your gas at- Eight dollars a gallon, yeah, 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 or you could buy it at four, you know, by what, using you know, control coins of gallon or whatever you want to call it. You know, it could be. It's always that's interesting a, to me how people start to pay attention when gas prices go up. Like all this other shit's been going on, but like gas prices, I think it's because it just stings more, right? When you get to the pump, and you're just like, ah. well, besides that, like gas goes up, food goes up because yeah, all that's the, the next, all, yeah, yeah, all the transportation involved next. goes up. Did you? I saw a picture of like. The average, like the cost it was like for a few years ago to fill up the tank of a big, you know, what is it? 18 wheeler, you know, diesel or whatever was like 800 something dollars. And now it's something like 1600 or $1,400. Just CCI. I think that's a huge increase wow. Wow. in the cost of fuel. So, all right. I'm, I got some, some, we'll take a left here. Yeah, can you lift us up a little I bit? I got you. <laughs> hey, so check this out. This is a, this company just created a new, um, I don't know, perk for employees, if you will. I would like to, like to know what your guys' opinion is if you think this will spread. So a sex startup. So this is a company. It's like a porn company, porn site called Strip Chat. <laughs> I'm not familiar with them. Yeah. But anyway, they're a, a startup called Strip Chat. And they have, this is a new perk. If you work for them, what they've built are called wank pods. So these <laughs> <laughs> this is real. You're not yeah. being trolled? No, this is real. So check this out, right? So. It's a it's a an, a a pod for masturbation. So if you're an employee there, you can go in the pod. Wow, and, what, what and this, a work benefit, right? And there. And here's what it says: It says here that each wink pod is planned to come fully equipped with masturbatory accessories, including a 4K LED screen to watch VR cams, boosted by Dreamcams technology, an Oculus Quest VR headset, lotion, tissues, and more. Dude, how mad are you for the janitor uh, <laughs> even in that place? <laughs> Uh, I'm I'm leaving, dude. Uh, <laughs> dude I resign. The other thing, so what, okay, now does the article serious question? Like, what is the what's the the logic behind this? Like, what is it supposed to? Is the idea that you're everybody needs a break and this is good for that people. you're going to be more productive? I mean, it's better than a cry closet. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, yeah I'm with you on that. Yeah, you know, but <laughs> I was picturing this right. Like, well, maybe they, maybe so it's they, a better way to maybe it doubles. Maybe it doubles is that go well, have a cry or maybe have a jerk. Cry or jerk. Like. So when I, when I was I know you're cry right. or tug. <laughs> you're right, yeah. All right. Hey guys, meeting's done. Uh, wank pods are open. So <laughs> it makes me the thing that comes to mind is like, won't people know? Yeah. How ashamed are you? Yeah. Like, like you, know? Know? Like, you know, bro, you just, couldn't wait to just opening home? up the like, pod. Really? Like, yeah. whew, like, like, Sal, that's the third time today. Yeah. Really? <laughs> how many times? Like, you dude, know? I got a big meeting. You know, like, <laughs> hey, I got to hey, get my mind it's right. It's like when you go to the bathroom and you see someone's shoes and you know who it is. Like, oh, it was John taking a <laughs> shit again yeah. for like 20 minutes. It's this time you knock on the door. Yeah. Who's in the wake pod? God damn it. They're taking up all the space. That is so That's Susan. She's so, okay, so what does the company do? There, you said they're a sex strip yeah. chat. A strip I'm, chat. What is that? Susan I'm interested. Toys in I'm interested in what they do. I have no idea. It's just a sex startup company, is what it said. Wow. It sounds like I mean, strip very chat. Very progressive. I'm gonna guess. Maybe Doug, you can look it up. Strip chat, but <laughs> another great search. So, this, so they're like fans only. Like that's weak, dude. We, you know, we're gonna one up you. Yeah, on this. I think it, it sounds like 
maybe you connect with people on your phone and they strip for you. I don't know. That's what I would guess. Has anyone been following the news on the OnlyFans? Huh. What's going on with them? Like, remember they weren't they trying to sell? And then what? The, I'm I'm even more convinced now that that was just like Holy a publicity shit. stunt. Oh, thank that, you, Doug. That strip chat up there. Oh hey. Yeah. So I think it's live. I got to purge my computer on that one, now. Doug. <laughs> hey Doug, why did you just why type in S Asian? and it came right up? Yeah. yeah. In, your, in your in your browser, <laughs> what's going on? Wow. A Andrew, wow. you got to use some uh, like blurry things. It's actually on this. look uh, um, classy. Yeah, wow. yeah it's, super classy. <laughs> they, try, they do. They look, the I mean, second the, one is. Uh, <laughs> I mean, from here it looks better than uh, Pornhub's like homepage. There, it looks uh, looks looks I good. Don't, I don't look at that stuff anymore. Yeah. Uh, okay. All right. So I'm Doug's gonna I'm, I'm gonna change directions again. Um, I was reading this really cool article on uh, Neanderthals and ancient humans. So I don't know if you, Justin, I'm sure you, because you think this stuff is cool. Um, my ears are perking. Your search history is so broad. I know. The yes. strip chat, yes. Neanderthals. <laughs> this guy's into some weird shit. <laughs> but I, you know, I, I was, so we know that Neanderthals and modern humans coexisted for thousands of years. Right. And then it, Neanderthals went extinct. They just, they don't exist. And so the prevailing theory is that modern humans? Yeah, they were ugly, and 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 Neanderthals warred quite a bit and fought each other quite a bit. And there's mm -hmm. lots of evidence of this, right? Like we'll see skulls of Neanderthals and modern humans with like you know like a blunt force trauma to the head or broken arm, like they were blocking something. And so I was reading this article about the speculations on how they fought, and Neanderthals were very heavily muscled strong and had bigger eyes. So they were better at in the dark and at close quarter combat. So they're hmm. fierce you know, uh, you know, combatants, right? Fierce people to fight with. But modern humans probably won because of technology. So we invented spear and stuff like yeah, that. Things, yeah. And so what they with so the article I read and I just had this picture of like how fucked up this is like Neanderthals with their clubs running around and then like, you know, modern humans throwing spears and running away. Oh, so the just, drone just like blows them up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, dude, that. how fucked up is that, right? Yeah. So you had all these like these different types of humans just fucking each other up. Yeah, well, I mean, I heard there was a lot of interbreeding uh, between that the too. species and that uh, I don't remember what it was called, like the species after that, but then a lot of them- Denisovians? Or? Denisovians. Yeah. And then they crossed the Great uh, Bering Strait uh, and then made their way to the Americas. But yeah, like it's it's interesting. That whole- history of like having different types of human species all coexisting at once and like the little hobbit uh yes. species and it's just a trip to me like I, I it makes me even more like think of of uh stories like lord of the rings where they take a lot of that stuff from old like like german uh uh i forget like that, and that, that whole history yeah and they kind of put it together um at how like that all those stories had some bits of truth in it yeah i mean there's evidence that we ate them and they ate us like and then of course it There's was crossbreeding which on. is probably more like we captured them and then you know had sex with them type of deal right. rather than working together yeah i mean we're all just disgusting yeah humans are pretty messed up yeah. you know you ever seen the 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 studies on chimps and what they do with uh, like competing clans vicious oh, yeah vicious. oh bro super violent they rip the competing you know chimps apart and yeah. eat them and do horrible terrible shit oh, to each other, and we're pretty closely yeah, related. We're, so we're, we're part animal after all. Did, yeah. did you see? Isn't uh, Lord of the Rings got a prequel that's coming out soon? They do. What? Yeah. They yeah. Do. Wait. Uh, yeah. Where? So it's on Amazon. Yeah, Amazon bought the rights a, long, a while back. I think we even brought that up, but uh, they spent a lot of money on this, and they're pretty much banking on it being like the next kind of Game of Thrones. Uh, so what all these wait. streaming services Epic. did, are you, I mean, are you picking up on this? Like with yeah. the whole Marvel? Yeah. And the, In any kind of franchise that has that epic of a story to build into. A following, yeah. right? Yeah. Wow, that's going to be cool. It's you know, my son's never seen uh, Lord of the Rings, by the way. Really? You know how excited I am to watch Lord oh. of the Rings with him? He's never well, seen him before. Dude, Lord of the Rings is amazing. Yeah. Oh, I love it. I'm surprised he hasn't. It's me too. I, I don't know is what kind of dad Is it that old? Is it that old? Lord of the Rings? Yeah. Uh, when did it come out? 20 years ago. Huh? Did you say about 20 years ago? 20? Yes, the, oh at least the God. original one did. Wow. So this is before Frodo and all that, right? So it's just like it's Saruman and like his rise. Yeah. And I think there's just wow. some side story. Did you guys, I don't really know yet. Did you guys watch when you were kids the animated movie of The Hobbit and mm -hmm. uh, Lord of the Rings with the weird singing in the beginning? <laughs> yeah. You ever watch that? I don't yeah. think I did. Bro, you got to watch. It is. Look at that. 20, 2001 it came out. Wow. You guys have got to watch uh, the, you have to watch the original, like the old, it's probably from the 70s or 80s. The cartoon one. 
Yeah, it's actually pretty good. It's a little creepy and a little weird at the same time. Remember, like, so they had those uh, uh, ring wraiths, or is that what they yeah. called? Yeah. So they they like come in and they're they're. I forget what kind of animation that is, but they actually use like real humans, humans, but then they like draw over them and it made it even more creepy. It was scary, dude. Yeah. They, were, they used to scare me. As a I'm trying to remember. So in high school we watched, I mean, we, uh, we read the Hobbit and I do remember us watching, watching a, a movie in school. And yeah. that was before, uh, cause you said, what did you say? 2001. So that was, definitely, Oh, it was bro, the, the it cartoon was, definitely before yeah, the cartoon the was except, school. maybe Duck and Fine. Yeah, late seventies. Like, I think it right? was like the seventies. And I remember specifically because of smog or smog, right? Yes. The, the, the oh, dragon uh -huh. and how they found this one scale that was missing and they shoot the arrow. And I was, I was like so excited when I was a kid when I watched it and I could never yeah, find it. Gollum was in there. Yeah. And then yeah. I got older and I watched it again and I went and this, this, I did try to show my kids at one yeah. point and the beginning with the singing and stuff was my kids were like, this sucks. <laughs> are the, are the books your, your boy reading? Is it, are they anything like what we read when we are like the same type of, dude, my son is into like, what are they reading? Like he, my son likes to read, uh, he read animal farm, uh, Fahrenheit, uh, whatever. Um, he reads all the classics and he's super into them. Interesting. You know, in fact, I'm getting him to read. That's it right there, Doug. Yeah. You see on the right, the freaking scary ass looking demons uh, yeah, or whatever. No, oh that. yeah, dude. That was creepy. When yeah, did that yeah, come yeah. out? 78? 78. Yeah. Dude, that was before I was born. That's wild. Whoa. Yeah. I, um, uh, so I'm having, I, I was introducing my son to Milton Friedman, right? Free to choose. Oh uh, yeah. And, but he's reading a lot of books right now, some for school. So, uh, on Blinkist, you can get free to choose 15 minutes and you really get a good, the gist of it. So it's a great way to kind of get the idea of a book. Right. And then if he wants to get in deeper, you can kind of pitch it to him that way yeah. too. And, and free to choose for me was life changing. I watched yeah. the series, which you can still watch on YouTube and they're like 19, like late seventies, early eighties. And Milton Friedman literally predicts all the stuff that you see in the decades past. So everything he says is super accurate. That's one of the cool things about Blink is that you have that ability just to get the little 15 to 30 minute totally. like, quick snip bit of it or whatever. Uh -huh. I just, I just cued something that was called evil genius. Cause somebody recommended it to me, which is, it's mm. all, it's all Milton Friedman and economics and all this stuff. It was written in 2020, but it goes all the way back to like Friedman era all the way to now and like what we've been doing. And I've been wanting to read it and I'm like, God, I got all these other things that I'm reading right now. So I like, I like it because I'm a information, like I love information, but I don't have oftentimes the attention span to go and just read a full book. Yeah. Well, you guys will laugh because you know, <laughs> I like reading articles, right? So now for all of us with ADD. Yeah. 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 So it's, I get on there and perfect. I get a, Oh, I like this book 15 minutes worth. Now, yeah. if I want to go back and read the whole book, I can, or I feel like I, I really think I it was made for you. I do. I, I, I think mm -hmm. it's like perfect for you. Cause that's how, that's exactly how every book I've ever sent to you. He always gets yeah. back to me. And I'm like, did you just like read the cliff notes? Cause I don't think you read the whole book. <laughs> yeah. I just told you to read that <laughs> the other day. The now I'm getting chunks like, of it. Yeah. yeah, yeah dude. Yeah, I read the back. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, did I tell you guys, I actually, you know how many, a done that before, you know how many reports I got an a on in class. By you just can. reading the back, and I've done that here. once, and I did get a good grade. I was so surprised. I always did if the following happened: if the in the teacher, my teachers always gave this option because kids would never take it. I would always be the only one. They would say, "You have the option of doing a written report or going up to the front of the class and doing an oral report." And ninety nine percent of kids don't want to go up to the class and do an oral report for ten minutes. Nobody wants to do that. Not now you talking Sal. to a kid like me? Yeah. I'm like, you mean I get to go up there and just. You mean everybody has to listen to me? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I, yeah, so, so I'd read the back of a book. I remember the, the first time I did it was for Lord of the Rings. That I was supposed to read that book. Yeah. And instead I watched the movie and I went up to class and I talked about society. And it really, it's a story about how <laughs> society is organized, but really it's on a thin line uh, and we're really very close to being uh, chaotic and bro. whatever. And the teacher gave me a standing ovation. I remember be, feeling oh slightly my, guilty. I, I would have died, dude, if I was in your class. I mean, imagine today being able to do it. There's Hilarious. so much information information on the internet now that so back when we were kids like you couldn't get away with a lot of that stuff no. you like you, you know they have teachers have tech uh like apps yeah and they, can, they can put it in and then it'll pick up yeah, if they'll kids see are how long you're actually on uh reading but still though okay the all those all that software is designed to do is to pick up patterns of like to see if it was plagiarized yeah right? plagiarized so i mean if you just were like i mean that's just late and you deserve to get in trouble for that like if you're so lazy that yeah, you copy rip, paste yeah you copy paste from the internet like some guy i would have had i would have found tremendous value just to be able to read research whatever it is that I need to write about and, and get 
articles totally. and then just sit down and like, oh, I like that. So I'm going to write that note down. Oh, I like that. Yeah. And then like put together your own paper. Totally. Like we had to go read from the, the book or the textbook or go buy, buy you know a book. That was my favorite stereotype ever like in 80s movies was like the bully that would like punch like this like nerd to like write them papers. <laughs> <laughs> like did that ever work? No. <laughs> like ever in the history of like I've never heard of somebody be like, beat the shit out of you if you don't give me an A. No, normally how that works is actually the, the, the nerd Nerdy kid doing it for the popular kid who the, the nerdy, popular kid protects them. That's right. Bit, the yeah. the popular kid just lets him in the circle type of. Deal. At least that's how I remember it being very. Yeah, common. that it's, sounds more reasonable. Like you that's rarely eighties. Is that uh, how you did it, Adam? Yeah, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> hey, look. Uh, you like the mafia? I'll let you, I'll you, I'll I'll you, you sit at with us if you want. Yeah, hey, you like the mafia? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, listen, I'll uh, I'll protect you. Yeah. Yeah. We'll let you in the party. I'll introduce you to some of the cheerleaders later on if you. I'll nice. get no, but it, I'll get Susan really to though, touch no, her Do you guys remember? Like, I remember it being more like that. Yeah. Where uh, if there was kids, because obviously kids did do that. Kids definitely wrote yeah. papers, but they didn't. They didn't. They didn't go beat them up. Yeah, they didn't beat them up. It was they befriended them. Yeah, and that right. was the thing. It was just like now totally. you get to. Yeah, that yeah. makes more sense. Hey, I want to bring up one of our sponsors. So Ned, you guys know Ned's Sleep Blend or whatever. Yeah. Which, by the way, oh, I used that last night as an emergency sleep product. Will put you out, out. Like you try that and you try not to get a good night's sleep. It's impossible. <laughs> But they reformulated it and added more, 24% more of the botanicals. So valerian root, passion nice. flower, skull cap. So s same thing, CBD and CBN. Which well, they do different. They added more, more. valerian, more skull cap, more passion uh, flower. More of it. Yes, dude. So I'm excited because I love their sleep product. But now that they're adding more of that, it's probably going to be even well, more. Well, like, yeah, for certain instances, like as an intervention for me, like I was a little bit under the weather, like fighting this little like naggy cough thing and like- I I just knocked my I haven't get able to get any good sleep, dude. And I was like, you know what? I need to get good sleep tonight, and then drop that. Wake up was, with a beard, Whoa, dude. Uh, yeah, seriously, <laughs> where am I, dude? I was like, I went through time. Yeah, yeah, it was good. great. Hey, did you guys uh, did you guys uh, watch Joe DeSena's uh, series? I haven't yet. It's in it's queued up for me to to watch, and it just went. Last Bro, he's on he's on mainstream TV. The guy's a character. The guy is a total character. He, he's this made thing. for TV. Yeah, you guys yeah. want to let's get him on the phone. Yeah, yeah. Let's ask him about this. We'll call him up. Ninety-five percent of companies fail in the first fifteen years. A high-performing organization needs to be able to adapt to its ever-changing environment. We argue about where the direction of the business is going to go. It's your fault. It's always our fault. Right. No, we need help, and I don't know what to do. You're under stress. Yeah. Come to the farm. I'm Joe DeSena, CEO and founder of Spartan, author, father, and just overall pain maker. What I do is get companies ready for the unexpected. We turn their whole life upside down. We're gonna make some serious change. We shine a mirror in their face and they transform. We're running a business here, guys, let's go! You wanna turn iron into steel? You heat it, you pound it, and you drown it. You don't know yourself until you've been tested. We're almost out of time! How would that employee react? How would that team react when the shit hit the fan? If you want to build trust between some individuals within your corporation, there's no better way than having folks suffer together. Oh, no, let him communication. Let him communicate. Oh, I'm the person you call for help. Can you hear us fine, Joe? I can hear you fine. Ah, so we were just talking off air a little bit. Um, I want to hear from you what the desired outcome of the show was we you kind of were alluding to obviously uh, it's great for to get the name Spartan out there but were your intentions to get a series going and to do multiple series what, what was the thought process you know years ago when we started Spartan and I and I announced a few races here and there I realized and you guys will appreciate this at mind pump right I realized how hard it was to find customers willing to do hard stuff oh, yeah. like you can build the most beautiful gym you can get really shiny kettlebells you could get everything you need in place but nobody's coming it's too hard if you were selling if we were selling cotton candy i'm like that's easy to sell cotton candy and handbags and all that stuff but i'm selling something hard so i said i need a television show i need a way to inspire people and bring them into the funnel especially if we're going to operate globally you know trying to do this in 45 countries no joke so i ran around with my kettlebell, I knocked on doors. I, I, I actually came to your studio there, right? I, I did everything I could to try to get a deal and get a TV show. 
And the one place I never knocked was CNBC, never focused on CNBC. And then out of nowhere, right before COVID, this thing just happened randomly. So, um, but the goal is to motivate people to do hard shit. Yeah, that's been a message of yours since, I mean, forever, right? When we first met, you talked about that and the value of doing hard things. So you're, what you're trying to do with the show is to convince people that there's value in doing things that are challenging and hard, and especially today, right? Especially in modern times. Well, I'm, I'm trying to, specifically for this show, I'm going after companies and I'm saying, look, business is hard. This is a combat sport. 95% of businesses that start are going to fail. Imagine... Imagine you guys being in a sport where 95% of the times you go out there, you're going to like, this is a tough sport. You got to have the stomach for it. You got to have the mindset for it. So I want to help entrepreneurs because I know how hard it is. And I believe, whether you believe it or not, whether the audience believes it or not, I believe the one thing we could do to make businesses more likely to succeed is to make them resilient is to create like mind fitness, mind pump, right? Get, get, them, get them to a place where no matter what, you can't make payroll, no problem. Competitor opens up a crush street, no problem. Factory burns down, no problem. Russia, Ukraine war, no problem. I'll deal with it, right? Yeah. And that, that's what the show is. Yeah. Do you think companies have, because if, if, if it seems like companies have been trying to do the opposite, make everything easier and easier for people. Do you think that that's to, the, to their detriment? Well, you guys remember Kodak. Kodak, um, for those listening that don't know, Kodak was the world's premier brand. Everybody knew it. it was, I think it was above Coca-Cola. Like Kodak was it. And I think, just like you asked, I think like most companies, we try to get everything nice and tidy. Everybody tries to make sure they get their nice salaries and benefits and everything else. We become extremely complacent as a company and then you go out of business. And so it, 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 like when you lose that fight, that daily grind, that there, there was a, a business book written that when I was first introduced to all these concepts back in the late 80s, it was called In Search of Excellence. I believe it was written by Peter Drucker. They interviewed 500 or 5,000 companies. I don't remember, it's like 30 years ago. And they found one common theme amongst successful companies. There was a monomaniac, male or female, a monomaniac on a mission. And they were just crazy and they had to do whatever they had to do to succeed. And when you lose that and you become soft and complacent, whether it's in business, your own life, your family, whatever, you lose. You remember what happened to Rocky Balboa oh, come on. after he <laughs> lost that, you know, that, that drive, right? What happens? He loses. Yeah. Do you, do you see this transformation with people who, I mean, we've talked about this off air, but people who do your races, right? Do you, do you see this transformation in them where they show up and eh, the friend convinces them? okay, I'll get in shape for this. Maybe I'll get, it'll motivate me to lose a few pounds or whatever. Then they do the race and afterwards, uh, you know, you, you've talked to us about this. Talk about the transformation you see from people who go from the office to climbing through the mud, jumping over walls, throwing spear, whatever. They change their mindset. They build what we call resiliency data points, RDPs in their brain, a place to go to in your brain when shit's hitting the fan. Look, we've got, I don't know, 30, 40,000 people around the world now that have Spartan tattoos and other 30, 40,000 have Puff Mudder tattoos. I bring that up. Uh, it's not that the tattoo is going to save you, but that's the narrative now that you start um, conveying to the world. Like I'm a Spartan, right? Nothing's going to get in my way. So yeah, the transformations are incredible. Uh, I lost hundred pounds, Joe. I no longer drink. I no longer do drugs. I started my company uh, over again. I got back with my wife, back with my husband. I, I, I somehow muscled through missing an arm and a leg because I'm a veteran and like the stories are unbelievable. And, and it happens under barbed wire. It happens out there in, in the battle. Joe, give us a little bit of a teaser of what to expect with this show. I mean, did you take uh, one company and do like their team? Was it multiple CEOs? Like I, I've seen little bits of the preview, but I, right. I don't I don't know exactly what's going down. Is it a lot like Spartan or are you doing a lot different things with them? Death race. That's what you use. A lot, a lot of people don't know this. I don't know if we've ever spoken about this, but um, for 22 years, I've been doing this on the farm. We have a farm in Vermont and I've been inviting companies like Google and Facebook and Tesla and Goldman Sachs. And they've been coming up to the farm, uh, U.S. Olympic teams uh, across various sports. And we just put them through the paces. We crush them in very unorthodox ways where they hate me and they hate the farm and they never want to come back. But then- <laughs> 
But then you hear about it later and they're like, oh my God, we completely transformed as a team. We completely transformed as a family, whatever. So what we've been doing for 23 years doesn't change with the show, which is simply I go in, I find out what are the three most um, obvious things that they're dealing with and they haven't resolved. Three big problems. Every company's got problems. I got tons of problems. My company, your company has problems. Every company has problems. Every family has problems. We shine a light on those problems, bring them to the farm, highlight those problems around some obstacle, some challenge, crush them. I mean, just crush their souls <laughs> and they come out, they come out stronger for it. Are there, are there certain characteristics you see in somebody when you first meet them where you could say, uh, they're not going to, they're not going to make it or, oh, uh, this person's going to, they're going to be okay, even though they may, maybe not, don't think so. You, you cannot judge a book by its cover. Wow. I've had, I've had 10 million people graduate our system somewhere in the world. And I think I, t- I think I told you guys a story years ago. Um, at some point I might have to, uh, how are we doing the time? We're right. Yeah, mm-hmm. we're good. Oh, I, think, I think, I think I told you guys a story years ago. Um, Amy Palmieri Winters, I don't really know her at this point. She's coming out of a challenge in ice cold water. We're we're forcing people to do a three mile swim. She's coming out of the water at like one o'clock in the afternoon, along with two six foot Marines that are jacked and they have six packs. And I told them before they started, I told everybody, if you don't finish by one o'clock, you're out of the event. Even though they've already invested like two days in this event, if they get knocked out, they're out. Marines come out of the water. Amy comes out of the water. Amy sits down, is unscrewing her leg to dump the water out. She's got a prosthetic leg. And I'm like, guys, you're out. Everybody's out. You missed the time by like 12 seconds. Sorry. And the Marines start crying. And it's nothing, it's nothing, nothing negative against Marines. Um, I've cried. You guys have cried <laughs> before. But she didn't. She screwed her leg back on. And she said, Joe, do you mind if I continue doing the race anyway for the next two days, even though I'm not officially in it? And so wow. if the three of us were trying to figure out who was a finish, like it would be the Marines. It would not be Amy with one leg. And that has happened to me 10,000 times over the last 23 years where it's that little person that you don't even expect to get it done. And, and they, they just have a stronger mind than the other people. Yeah. So back to the shows, is, is it uh, one team that you're, you're bringing on? Is it multiple companies? Like, give me, give me an idea what, what to expect in this. One team, Mind, Mind Pump would come on. I would go to Mind Pump's offices. Okay. We would sit down. We'd say, look, we got three problems. You guys come back and that's an episode. And, and then I check in with you three months later and you're like, Joe, don't ever call us again. We have PTSD. We don't want to talk to you. <laughs> or, or more likely, oh my God, uh, we hated you when we were there, but we're, we're better for it. <laughs> oh, that's great. Any, any, any surprises that you can, you could talk about or is it all hush hush until the show comes out? Um, I guess the one surprise, well, it's no surprise, right? CNBC, they're not used to somebody like me. So when they were filming, it was, <laughs> it, was it was to say it was challenging. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, I had every five minutes medical running over to me, this person, oh my God, we're going to have to cancel. You have to stop. I would. No, if you guys want it to be authentic, you got to let me go. So it was a lot of, it was a lot of push pull. And it's awesome because at the end of the season we filmed, they said next season, we're going to let you really, really go. And um, my wife, by the way, she watched the first episode unedited and she, she was like, I can't take it. 22 years of you doing it live. And now I got it on TV. Like this is, I just can't be around you anymore. Yeah. So it, it hasn't done a great thing for my relationship just because it's just more of Joe, right? Turning the hot water off, waking everybody up at 530 in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> nobody, nobody died though, right? Everybody yeah. survived? Not that we know of. So is this the second season is already set to happen too? I mean, did you sign a multiple season contract? What, what went down? You never, you never know. Again, I've been around trying to get TV deals done for got a decade and uh, all, all uh, arrows are pointing towards this is going to be like a 10 year run, but you never know. Oh, wow. I swear to God, Joe, when I first met you, I said, this guy should be on TV. (laughs) He's a fucking character, character, but a real character. So I feel like this is hundred percent made for you, man. Oh yeah. I I hope so. I hope, um, look, I don't want to spend 65 days a year filming. But if it but if it helps us with our mission to change 100 million lives and it saves a bunch of businesses, then that's my job. 
Yeah, yeah no. good deal. I'm Very excited cool. for it. I know we're I know we're limited on time. I don't want to I don't want to take up too much of your time. But uh, give a what channel, what days, time, all that stuff like that. Give a quick shout out to when it goes. Yeah, CNBC tonight, East Coast time is 10 p.m. Uh, West Coast time is 7 p.m. I assume it runs at the same time across the country, and uh, it'll always come after Shark Tank on Tuesday night. All right. Is um. So if you can get like 45 million of your friends to watch it tonight, that'd be awesome. Uh, it won't work. I only have 42, so we're yeah. going to be a little shy there. I, I'll, hey, I'll <laughs> add this, by the way, for anybody who watches this. I've met Joe. That What you're going to see, I, as crazy as it's going to seem, this is how the guy is in real life. So he's uh, he's not your typical person. What so. a great time slot right after Shark Tank, man. That's a good That's a good time slot for you, huh? I'm hoping. Yeah, yeah, I'm hoping. Of course. Hoping. That I love that show. So that's a that's a good that's a good that's a good show that's to good follow, follow, man. Yeah. Well, good luck and we don't want to be on the show, but thank you very much for using <laughs> yeah. us as an, as an example. And after <laughs> shit settles down, make sure you come by, come by the studio and say hi so we can have a nice good long conversation about everything. I will come to California. I told you once once I'm out there and we'll have some fun in the studio and like usual we'll call a bunch of my friends while I'm in the room. Yes, please. Yes, <laughs> please. Sounds good, Joe. Thank you so much, Joe. Yep. Look, if you're a fitness fanatic, which you probably are, you're watching and listening to Mind Pump, uh, you eat a high-protein diet. You also eat adequate amount of carbohydrates for energy and healthy fats. But if you have digestive issues, this makes things very difficult, especially if you're trying to bulk or reverse diet or speed up your metabolism. You're boosting calories, but you get bloated. You don't feel like you digest the protein right. Things don't just feel right. You, you've got some inflammation. This can be a big problem. It can get in the way of your goals. This was an issue for me for a long time. Um, that's when I found Bioptimizers. Bioptimizers has digestive enzyme products designed for fitness fanatics like us to help with digestion, to help assimilate, break down and assimilate the proteins, fats, and carbohydrates so they, get, they can get to the muscle tissue that I want. They can make my body healthier, help with the bloat, help with the digestive issues, reduce inflammation after eating a meal. Buy Optimizers, great company. You got to go check them out. Head over to mindpumppartners.com, click on Buy Optimizers, check out their digestive enzyme products. Um, and the code is mindpump10, mindpump10 for a discount. All right, here comes the rest of the show. Our first caller is Connor from California. What's happening, Connor? How can we help you? What's up, guys? Wow, What's first up? caller. That's kind of cool. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, just wanted to say thanks for all the information you guys put out. Really, really love listening to it. It's kind of my go to health and fitness podcast these days. Um, I have two questions for all of you. One is about kind of coming back from injury and how to get back into lifting. And the other is about using wearable devices and like sleep tracking, activity tracking as part of your coaching. Um, and uh, yeah, do you have a preference with which one I'd start with? No, go ahead and start with the one you you, you want to start with. doesn't matter. Okay, cool. Um, so quick, quick backstory. Um, I have kind of a history just with, with sports in general. Um, played volleyball full time in Denmark for a year, and, and I have a master's in sport and exercise science. Um, and with that came basically the I have a very strong ability to just kind of push through pain. Um, and I just for my entire life have been able to kind of just work really hard to get through things. But with that comes a lot of injuries and a lot of just kind of chronic overuse. Um, and so the story starts kind of back in August of 2021. Um, got a concussion and whiplash injury from playing soccer. Um, so I've taken quite a bit of time off from volleyball over the last six months, um, recently starting to get back into it, but, um, I am struggling to, to just get back into it at a slow pace. And I have a, I have a desire to just kind of jump right back in. Um, so I'm curious kind of what your thoughts are on, on how to navigate that, especially getting back into lifting. Um, cause I used to lift very frequently, but, um, haven't since the injury. Can we, can so we get a little bit there. more detail on, um, the kind of injury you had? Yeah. So, uh, playing soccer, I was defending the goal. Um, and this happened on two separate occasions. Um, I wasn't far, I wasn't close enough to really make a, a defensive move on the defender. So I just kind of stood there and tried to block it. And I took the ball to, to my face on the left side. Ooh. Um, that happened twice throughout the game. And, um, as you know, as you probably imagine, I didn't want to stop playing. So I just continued playing for the next hour or so. Um, the concussion was, I would say pretty mild, like no, no nausea, no vomiting, no, um, loss of consciousness, anything like that. But over the next few days, definitely felt fatigue, headaches, dizziness, et cetera. Um, and since then, I've been basically trying to figure out how to recover from this. Um, I listened to your guys' podcast on mobility a few months back, and that's when I got Maps Prime, Maps Prime Pro. And I was working through those things. Uh, but I've also found that most things on, in those test lists, I pretty much fail. So it's kind of hard mm -hmm. to know where to start with that. Um, 
but yeah. Okay. So, well, so to answer the maps prime pro question, I would pick your favorite four or five movements and just practice those until you get really good at them. And then you can move on to some other ones. Um, really there's no wrong answer with that. If you find that you're failing a lot of the different tests now, back to what you said about your injury, I am really glad I asked you about the details. It's very different from mm -hmm. traditional injury where somebody, you know, sprained an ankle or, or tore a, a ligament in a, in a joint concussions. No joke. You're going to have to just base it off of feel. There's really no standard protocol where, I mean, we could get like MRI imaging and stuff like that, but even that's not going to be a hundred percent. It's going to have to be completely off of feel and you're going to have to really be sensitive to listening to your body and how the workouts are affecting you and how they're affecting your sleep. That's the thing I would pay attention to most when you're looking at uh, any kind of a you know mild brain injury. Sleep will tell you quite a bit. Either your inability to sleep or excessive fatigue. Like anything that's out of the ordinary will let you know that you probably aren't out of the weeds and you should really slow your your tempo and slow how fast you progress. Well, what do you what do you think about? I think this also presents a good opportunity for you maybe to change kind of your focus around training, right? So like, you know, the athletes always have this kind of athletic mindset that they apply to lifting weights, which is, you know, higher intensity and and pushing PRs and you know, I, I would I would love to see him do something like maps performance and, you know, super light on the load and let's get really good at your movement. Let's double and triple down on the mobility days and really spend a lot of time on working on that, especially since you've already done the the prime test and you failed most all the tests. So we know there's definitely uh, room for improvement there. So shifting away from probably your in your traditional intense type of weight training routine and maybe focused on just overall movement and working towards mobility. Like, and I just think that is probably a, a safer direction to move right now when you're, you're recovering from something like a concussion at the same time. And then like what Sal said is I'd be listening to my body and just, you know, waiting for me to feel like I'm hundred percent again before I really try and ramp up intensity. I mean, that's kind of the direction I would go. Yeah. Two yeah, things that would look difficult. Oh, sorry, one. Justin, go ahead. No problem. Um, I'm being somebody here who's probably had the most concussions in the group. <laughs> yeah, that's um, no argument here. Bit of an authority. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, one thing that uh, was a real you struggle would, uh, for would me. I forget, I forget what I was going to say. Wait a minute, <laughs> <laughs> squirrel. Um, it was in class. Was just focusing. Was really really difficult for me. Um, and also like the random headaches and things like that. So, you know, I don't know if you're experiencing anything like that, but it, it definitely took me a while to, to regain sort of that focus, uh, ability. And, uh, one thing that I've, I've noticed from isometric training or just to be able to kind of direct all of my intent as I go to train towards something that's just one simple attribute, one feature, uh, that I could boil it down to, uh, really helped a lot. And so I don't know if that's something that, you know, you can look into s applying some certain techniques like that, where, uh, you know, I think that would actually help, uh, neurologically to, for you to kind of like regain a bit of focus. That's a good point. Two other things, Connor, um, and I want you to look into this, okay? So don't just take my advice. I, I, I think you should go do your own research. But look into the the neuroprotective effects of cannabinoids from mm -hmm. uh, like hemp, right? So CBD and all of the cannabinoids. It was very helpful hemp. for me. I was, yeah, I'm glad you brought that yeah, up. Yeah, so THC maybe not so much. So I wouldn't go the, the weed route necessarily because that might have some detrimental effects. But look into like high quality, full spectrum hemp oil. Like we work with a company called Ned. But research cannabinoids and brain health, and then also research lion's mane and its neuroprotective and neurogenesis promoting effects. Those are two things that I would personally, and again, I'm not telling you to do this. Yeah. I think you should look into it. But if it was me, I would be using uh, hemp oil a couple times a day, and I would be supplementing with lion's mane to help accelerate the healing process uh, what, from the concussion. What about like a, and obviously like ketogenic diets aren't really great for like high intensity sports, but yeah. that's, the, I mean, there has been some benefit neurologically with that. There can be, but I would look more at those other two things because they're, uh, the research that I've seen with cannabinoids and with lion's mane are more specific to kind of what we're talking about. Right. Um, so I, I would look into those. Okay. So it's lion's mane and look up cannabinoids and 
you know, brain health or brain inflammation. You know what, to Justin, Justin just reminded me, he brought up a really good point about the isometric training. Doug, w when will this officially air? This will air next week or this week? Uh, next week. So next week, will we have the new program out by then? Uh, I don't think it's going to be quite out, but very soon after that. Yeah, so right after that. We can't talk too much about it, Connor. But well, the we new should send it to him anyway. We got his email. Can you? Can you do that? Can you send it? You're not You're not we'll, packaged up, are you, yet? Uh, no, we can send it for sure. We'll, okay, we'll yeah. send you. We'll send you. Oh, our, look at that. Be the first. You get an exclusive. Surprise math oh, wow. program that we can't talk about. Yeah. So, okay. <laughs> but we think it'll, it'll benefit you. Now, you said you had a second question about wearables. Yeah, I do. Um, and just really quick on that. Um, the Lion's Mane, I actually do take Lion's Mane. Awesome. Every other day right now, the Four Sigmatic is the best one that I've found per yep. your guys' recommendation. Awesome. How long have you been taking it? Um, pretty much, well, I guess I've been off and on for the last couple of years, but recently within the last two weeks. Okay, good. And um, you, you noticing any improvements? Oh, I find that, I think, Justin, to your point, I definitely had the same kind of like neurological uh, impact where I ha definitely mm -hmm. have had issues focusing. And um, I find that that really helps me to just like really gear in my ability to prioritize oh, things. So good. And, um, and you know, with lion's mane, what the research that I've seen shows this linear effect. So like the more, the longer you take it, uh, it continues to improve and give you a better effect over time. So awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I'm doing like the blending into the coffee thing every morning. It really just like, it's, it's a great thing for me. Awesome. So yeah. Um, and then, yeah, thank you for the, for the program. I'll just, you know, I'll be sure to, to post it everywhere. Before you guys release it, awesome. <laughs> don't don't yeah, don't, yeah. don't share it, please. Yeah. Then, I'm okay. just kidding. What was your question um, around wearables, Connor? Yeah. So um, my question is basically, what, when you guys are coaching clients who have wearable devices, um, I wear an Aura Ring, for example. Um, are there are there ways that you kind of teach clients to use the data from things like an Aura Ring or an Apple Watch or Fitbit? Um, and I'm just thinking, like, for my own personal use. I mean, I I use the sleep data, but it's more of like an interesting thing to me. It's not quite like a, I must do this because my data says this. Yeah. Um, so I'm just curious yeah. what your thoughts are. Do, look at trends. That's the best yeah. thing to do is I wouldn't look at a day to day. I would look at trends. Oh, I noticed when I drink coffee past this point, my sleep is affected in this way. Or I noticed when I do a sleep routine, you know, it's affected in this way, or I've been using melatonin or I've been using lion's mane or, or been any using gross, like irregularity. Yeah. Know, that, like kind of spikes up. Like what was that? potentially yeah or, look at trends or on the positive side you have this you know you you string because i know aura ring scores your sleep right and so if like all of a sudden you have a couple outliers where you score like a 90 on your sleep or something that's really good right because i think it's tough to score like in the 90s consistently you know pay attention to what your diet was that day and you know what your activity level was in the sleep the night before and so yeah you know the thing with wearables is that i think people get in trouble is when they they try and they, they give it uh, too much weight where it's like every day they see something off and then they're trying to constantly adjust. It's like it's just a great feedback tool for you to just have a little bit more data around the stuff, all the stuff that we should be trying to pay attention to as it is, like your sleep, like your diet, like your stress levels, like your training routine. And just use that just as another data point to try and piece together like you, what, what makes your body respond the best and sleep the best and perform the best and um, but don't don't overthink it. I think that's the problem with sometimes with the wearables is, you know, oh, I scored a 75. Does that mean this? Or th it's like, well, OK, well, this, you know, one day and let's see what happens when the next couple of days. And so, uh, yeah, take it take it with a grain of salt. Yeah, I think that's the challenge for sure, because oftentimes you see the number or the score or whatever it is. And then, you know, immediately the thought is, oh, that's how I should be feeling. Even yeah, if that's not really how you're feeling. It's you a know? lot. It's a lot like the scale, right? I mean, it's just, it's even more did. And what I mean by it's a lot, a lot like the scale is, you know, clients would, uh, you know, that want to let's say, for example, lose weight and they weigh themselves every day. And then all of a sudden they get on the scale one day and the scale goes up one pound and all of a sudden they adjust their yeah, program. Exactly. Now all of a sudden the next day they're doing cardio and they cut their calories anymore. It's like, whoa, dude, one day of yep. seeing the scale go up, that there could be a lot of other things that contribute to that. The same thing goes for a thing like an aura ring where, you know, your sleep could be off and you think it's diet related or you think it's the workout, but well, maybe that day was just stressful for you. Yeah. Or maybe you had a lot on your mind or maybe you and your, your partner were debating something right before you. I mean, it could be a lot of different things that could throw off one day. And so just take it with a grain of salt, you know, use it as like another data point to help get a better idea of what makes your body feel and perform the best. Yeah. Great, great advice, Adam. It makes me think of like, uh, you're driving on a wet road and the, the car turns a little bit and you overcorrect with yeah. the steering wheel. Next mm. thing you know, you're you're, you're off the road and you're crashing. Totally. So yeah, great advice. Thanks for calling in, yeah. Connor. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks guys. Appreciate it again. No keep, keep up the good work. Thank you.
Yeah, we're talking about concussions, and um, you know, I I tried on one of Justin's hats once, just so people <laughs> need, need, I get the context here. And it literally Little like bucket. Oh, it like yeah, it's like it came down to my my my, my nose because his head's so big. It, I got a thick skull. Whatever gave you a concussion would have killed me. It's just yeah. what, that's basically what I'm trying to say here with all that. But yeah, but yeah, I'm so glad I asked him about what kind of injury because. I know. Uh, boy, is that a different approach. You know, I would be much more cautious. Yeah, than like a torn. <laughs> it's so much easier to see, oh, my knee's better, right? Yeah. With a concussion, it can be like, you have to look at things like sleep and mood and concentration. I don't uh, know why I didn't think the isometric di the direction. I just think that's a, yeah. a, a brilliant, safe, smart, good direction for them to go. Is to yeah. Chill. Well, I, that's just one of those things too. And I, I've, I've actually worked uh, with somebody who was working on like a brain fitness program and everything. And that was like something that he found was very helpful. It's just, I think it's just, uh, you know, just directing all of your focus in one spot. Like it, that's probably one of the best examples of like being able to just like hyper focus in on something. And that's, that's the training. That's yeah. all you really need to do because uh, you know, concussions, like the, the physicality on top and all the different type of movements you want to add and all that with training. It's just like, it's a lot, you know, for, for how your head is, is really just trying to heal itself. To that point, maybe something like, uh, including stability type stuff too. So maybe yeah. isometric and stability totally. type training would be, that'd be helpful. And I think that's the idea. Like, you know, you got something going on with your body. You're not a hundred percent sure. Like we don't know for sure either. And so I think if it was a client, I would be doing things like that. Like, Hey, you know what we're going to do for the next couple of weeks? Let's train some isometrics. Let's focus a little bit on stability. Mm -hmm. and, and that's kind of the direction I was going with the performance and lighter intensity. I was thinking that way. But isometrics and stability training just in general is, I think, a better recommendation. Our next caller is Deanna from Alabama. Deanna, what's going on? How can we help you? Hey. So I'm a massage therapist, a physical therapy assistant, and a gymnastics coach. I've coached gymnastics for about 15 years now. Um, I just coach one day a week now as a hobby, and last year, my fiance Spencer, convinced me to listen to podcasts, and y'all's podcast is the one that he recommended, and so we actually bought a bunch of programs and started doing those over the past year, so as I learn things, I just take it back to my gymnasts to kind of see like how we can improve their, um, their skills and all that, so anyway, I have noticed that they kind of have like, decreased thoracic mobility, increased lumbar lordosis, and then when we try to fully extend their arms overhead, they compensate by like, arching their back, kind of in the lower like thoracic lumbar area. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm thinking that it is more lats, but these girls also have issues with the hamstrings. And so I've tried to do a couple of tests to see if maybe it's hip mobility versus like hamstring tightness. And it's probably like 50, 50 on them. So I'm just trying to figure out like what the mo best mobility exercises would be because we're really limited on time. They do a like dynamic warm up and everything at the beginning and they do a cool down at the end that we could incorporate stuff with into. Oh, what a great question. I love this. All right. So three things come to mind for me that I would do. I would do, I would have them hang on a bar, but while they're hanging, I would have them focus on getting into a bit of a posterior pelvic tilt, right? So they're hanging okay. fully extended. Obviously, lats are going to be stretching. They're going to have full extension to the upper body, but then work on the posterior pelvic tilt so they can activate their core at the same time. The next yeah. thing I would do would be an overhead carry. So, and you could start with real light resistance. It could be a broomstick, but what they'll do is extend their arms, maintain the position you want them to maintain, and then try to do that while walking. That's going to be very difficult for some of them. Um, and then the third thing I would do would be the wall test that we have in Maps Prime. Do you have Maps Prime, by the way? Yes, we have Prime and Prime Pro. Beautiful. So in Maps Prime, there's that wall test. That is going to be really mm -hmm. good at activating and, and getting the muscles kind of coordinate in the way that you're you're talking. So those would be the three things that I would try uh, right out the gates. I like that. I would mm -hmm. I, maybe add the scorpion in there. Um, I think, do we, do, <laughs> is the scorpion in our um, Prime Pro? Do you know, Justin, off the top of your head? Uh, active scorpion, I think so. Yeah, active scorpion. If if not, it's in performance. But yeah, okay. So we, I know we have it in one of the programs for sure. So I, I might add that to it. And I think we did a YouTube video. 
<clears throat> that actually showed what you're talking about, Sal, where you kind of hang from a bar. I remember I, I think I showed it where you had a barbell. I actually had a barbell behind yeah. your, your back to keep you from swinging. Mm -hmm. And then just so you could focus on rolling up. Mm -hmm. So we have a YouTube video on, on what was Sal was talking about. I know we have, I, I'm pretty sure we have the active scorpion in the, the programs. And then the other one, the other yeah. ones you talked about. I like, I like the hanging because uh, when they're hanging, because what happens when they try to push up and extend, it's really hard to simultaneously get them to correct that lordosis and get that thoracic mobility. So they're doing that real excessive mm -hmm. arch. Mm -hmm. But when you're hanging, they're no longer focused on pushing and extending the arm. So they could focus just on the lordosis aspect. And what they'll do is they'll be able to connect a more, uh, you know, kind of a posterior pelvic tilt, not obviously in that, all the way in that direction, but more so than the lordosis. So they can focus on that while the arms are already kind of passively fully extended that should get the body to connect a little bit differently. And then I would do the overhead carries with a broomstick from there. And it should, you should see some connection there that you can work with, but it might take a second, right? Because, you know, being gymnasts, obviously they're moving in ways that now that have become very efficient for them. So they kind of have to relearn how to get in certain positions. I so, was just going to bring up, I mean, we're assuming because they're athletes, mm -hmm. they're going to go right to stuff like that, but you might have to regress down to just a, a back press just to get them to know how to articulate yeah. their, their hips like that. So maybe lay them on the floor first and get them to understand mm -hmm. what you're That's trying to get point. them to articulate. And then I really like the, the hanging roll-ups or whatever you want to yeah. call those. I think that's, that's the place to be so long as they can they can do that. Yeah, yeah and I'm sure you're doing like cat and all that. Like there's there was ways that uh, in kin stretch they were able to like articulate each like vertebrae kind of going up towards the thoracic spine to you know be able to get gain access and and mobility there. Um so that that was just one that was coming to mind besides what they said is is pretty much going to yeah. cover. Deanna, it. here's another good regression. So if the hang is a little too challenging, you can have them lay flat on the floor with their arms extended. And have okay. them hold on to a band that's pulling their arms away from them. Almost like they're hanging, but obviously it's a band, so it's not going to be as much resistance. And then while they're in that position, see if they can flatten out their lower back, right? So so their okay. arm, their, does that make sense what I'm saying? Yeah, it does. I think we've done it in physical therapy before. Okay, cool. So it's like they're it's pulling their arms, straighten them out, and then but they're going to obviously have this arch because they're flat on the back on the on the floor, and then have them press their low back into the floor while allowing the bands to pull their arms away from their. That could be body. an exercise in itself totally. too. Just you know, focus on intensifying that. Right? How hard they can they pr can they press their yep. low back into the ground yep. and do yeah. good solid the ground hold. into the wall. I mean, any yep. kind of solid surface that you provide feedback is going to help. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Excellent. And then what about the hamstrings part? Because we're doing a lot of like mobility stuff for the hamstrings, but I, I haven't, I don't know if it's hip mobility or if it's actual hamstring tightness. So where do you see mm -hmm. the issue? Like, um, so like our biggest skills that are having issues with is just kind of like doing leaps and doing split jumps and stuff like that. So it's anything where like the hamstrings are kind of stretched over two joints. Okay. And there's, I see. So when they're, yeah. when they're jumping and going into like a split, like a, like a, a split forward kick. split mm -hmm. and you see some limitation there. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. It might be weakness in the hip flexor. Uh, the hip flexor okay. might not be strong enough to straighten their leg out, but nonetheless, if you do hamstring stretches, I would get into the hamstring stretch while in the stretch, I would activate the, the muscles that oppose the hamstring, like the hip flexors mm -hmm. and the quadriceps, because it's not a passive, they don't need pla passive flexibility. They need the hamstrings to be able to allow them to move through dynamic movements. So you're going to want to activate the muscles that hold that hamstring in the stretch. Does, does that make sense? Yes, it okay. does. All right, perfect. All right, cool. I think, I hope that helps. Yeah, it does. And we actually just started Scorpions last week. That was something I just mm. incorporated. So that's perfect. Very cool. How nice. old are these uh, athletes, by the way? Um, I coach like a in-between group and then I help out with team. But I want to say they're anywhere from like six years old to like 14. Oh, well, they, they're in good hands. Uh, what, yeah, what's your background? Mm. You obviously know what you're doing. Um, so I coached uh, gymnastics for about 15 years. Mm. And then massage and then physical therapy assistant. So I have like two years of physical therapy assistant um, experience. And then I like work as a massage therapist now full time. Awesome. Oh, good deal. Awesome. Well, good luck with everything. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Deanna. Do you think maybe uh, I'm trying? I'm trying to picture right now the the jump with the kick because I rarely ever have I, I ever have met a, a gymnast that has that doesn't have the the range of motion 
in the hamstrings, right? So yeah. flexibility there. I mean, any maybe it's strength and control in the hips, like just yeah. the inability to get take it all the way. Like so, maybe like a ninety ninety with the heel lift and yeah, you know. it's it, I would say it's all strength unless it literally is just super tight hamstrings. But I've worked with yeah. athletes like this where it, they have good passive flexibility. But then when it's when dynamic movements required, mm -hmm. it's like oh I, I need more stretching here, and I say actually you need well, the stronger you, muscle that gets is, in a position. Yeah, in terms of dynamic stuff for like hamstring, besides you know your typical sort of punter kicks and dynamic walks with that, like that's why I got into uh, inchworms and, yeah, and something yeah. where I could like you know bring the hips up quite substantially so I could get like in range activation. You know what? I can't believe that we missed an opportunity here that this this might have been the first time in 7 years and what 1800 episodes that we may have actually had an opportunity to recommend a Jefferson curl. Oh, wow. Oh yeah, well I mean gymnastics, yeah. No, sure. and the, it literally specifically to that. No way. That, that's either, really right? where yeah. it stems yeah, from. Yeah, yeah. Or real light, you know, mm -hmm. just like just a uh, stick. Yeah. I mean that might that might be the move uh, for her, and we didn't even use that opportunity. You just never see that. I don't think yeah. I've ever recommended a Jefferson curl to anybody, but here is a, a potential client where they might see some. I think some, that's what it was made for. I think it was for gymnastics. So. Yeah. 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 yeah, and, and for, for sure exactly that, for that is to is to build strength and control because, like you said, they can probably lay their heads down in their lap, so they could probably get yeah. in a stretch. It's about being able to tense up and, and activate right. the muscles, and so doing that in a little. It's probably yeah. Hmm. Well, check that out. I'm sure she'll listen to this. If you don't know what a Jefferson curl is, look it up, and this might be a case where you uh, have might add some value. Our next caller is Mike from California. What's happening, Mike? How can we help you? Hey, uh, without going too far into my uh, my whole life story, uh, I've basically been lifting weights on and off um, ever since high school. Um, but the last like maybe five or six years, I've kind of lost the motivation um, to kind of do so, and then. Um, and then whenever I would kind of get back into lifting, I would just recovery would be take forever and really sore. Um, I would then get in uh, just recently kind of uh, started checking my testosterone levels and I've uh, been on PRT for the last maybe three months. And um, now now that I have the motivation and I'm able to actually lift and um, feel good while doing so, um, I'm trying to figure out the right um, program to use. I, I have MAPS Anabolic. And I'm worried that um, it's not frequent enough in terms of like trying to get my um, get myself on like a schedule um, since it's like two or three days a week. I was wondering if it would be a, like a, a better idea just for my like timing to do it, like to find a program that would be like smaller sessions every day, like split style, or if it would if I should stick with you know a more tried and true program um, that may or may not fit my schedule as well. Okay, so the question is really about consistency, and you feel like doing workouts every day would help you with your routine consistency. Is that am I correct? Yeah, it's kind of what I was like program versus schedule sort of thing or consistency. Yeah, I like okay. this. And how how do you feel recovery wise after your MAPS anabolic workouts? Uh, I did the um, I did my first like the pre phase um, before I started TRT, and uh, it kicked my butt. Like I was I was sore for like four or five days after the first time I was doing it. Um, I've kind of transitioned into phase one and I'm, I feel good afterwards. I am having a hard time keeping up with the, um, the trigger session. So yeah. like doing those, like the motivation to get those out there. Okay. So, well, here's my question then. If you're finding, if you're struggling with trigger sessions, what makes you think that, that doing workouts every day is going to be more effective for your consistency? Um, I guess maybe it's like the mentality of it. Like, I, I feel like it's not like a full on workout sort of thing. Like it's kind of more of a, I guess, you know, as, as you guys kind of do, it's like a trigger session. It's not a full on, like I'm yeah. putting in a lot of work. I, I get situation. that. I mean, a lot of people treat it. I mean, I'm guilty of this, like is as an afterthought, instead of thinking of it as a program, that's the one drawback I think of, of labeling them as trigger sessions or this ad added benefit mm -hmm. versus like, this is part of the program. Uh, there's a couple things though here. I mean, what I know where Sal's leaning, which is, you know, Hey dude, just, on those other days, go to the gym and do the trigger sessions, you know, and, and that would be, I think the best advice for you would be, you know, Hey, can commit to going to the gym every day, you know, five or five days a week, whatever is you think is good for your consistency, just on every other day, go walk on a treadmill for a half hour and then do trigger sessions mm -hmm. for 15 to 20 or minutes do mobility. or do mobility. Like that would probably be the best advice. Now there, there, you can do this too. Um, it wasn't written with this intent, but I've done it before where 
I split up anabolic. So I do half of the workout on one day. The next day I do the other half. And then when I- Now you have a five or six day a week routine. Yeah, now I have a five or six day a week routine. So nothing says that you can't uh, do that either. So yeah, I was yeah, debating doing that as well. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I totally respect the idea. I've talked about this a long time ago on the show, especially when I was really consistent, um, was I, I like being in this like routine of, you know, every day going to the gym because I, I discipline, it's like brushing your teeth. Like it would be hard to brush your teeth just four days a week, you know, and make a habit out of it. Cause then you forget one day or whatever, right? You do so you it, brush one tooth on one day. Yeah. Another tooth on <laughs> yeah, one. yeah. You know, just the consistency of I've carved this time out for myself to take care of myself. Um, I, there's nothing wrong with that. I, and I'm, I'm all for people, you know, disciplining themselves to carving that time out for exercise. Just, you need to modify the mistake they make is then they want to do a, a maps anabolic foundational day, five days or seven days a week, which that's not a good idea, but you could either one split up the anabolic routine and in, into two days. So now you have like a six day a week routine or do what I think Sal probably was going to head towards, which is pushing you towards probably doing the trigger sessions more consistently. I'll tell you what, Mike, if you give the trigger sessions a chance and you do two or three of them a day on your off days, okay? So on your off days, do one in the morning, one in the afternoon, and one at night. Give it two weeks and you'll be sold on their effectiveness. It's very different from traditional workouts, but it really is like a turbo in terms of results. I mean, you'll see yourself get leaner and stronger and get better pumps in a very, very short period of time. So if you feel like you can give it a shot for at least a couple of weeks and be consistent with two to three of them a day on your off days, I think you'll be more than pleasantly surprised. Now, how have you been feeling with those foundational like phase one type workouts? Because I know you said the pre-phase kind of kicked your butt. I've been feeling really good with them. Um, I don't really have, I'm still trying to figure out my, like my maxes on stuff. So I'm not sure like, but I do like, you know, I'm doing four sets of four. And, you know, feeling like it's definitely kicking, you know, like hard and, you know, cool. I don't think I can do much heavier sort of thing. And then mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not really feeling sore um, afterwards, like the next day. So I'm mm-hmm. feeling pretty recovered every day. I got something for you, Mike. Okay. Here's, here's something that might help you. I'm going to send you the no BS six pack formula. Okay. I actually have that. That came with my, my uh, beautiful anabolic. So bundle. here's what, here's what you do. Monday is maps anabolic foundational workout with uh, no BS six pack formula trigger sessions. Tuesday okay. is no BS six pack formula foundational workout with maps anabolic trigger sessions and so on. And you do that all the way Monday through Saturday. So you're actually doing a, either a foundational workout from one of the programs plus trigger sessions from the other program or vice versa. And that's a Monday through Saturday uh, program. So you're doing all the foundational workouts plus the trigger sessions of each program on alternating days. And they were designed to work together that way, like a puzzle piece. Uh, that's actually okay. one of my favorite ways to follow both programs. Okay, yeah. I can give that a shot. All right, perfect. Thanks for calling in, man. Cool, thank you. No problem. I, 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 I do, part of me gets it with the consistency of every day. And then part of me is also likes to tell people, look, first of all, you can go to the gym every day. You just don't have to lift every just day. You can do lots mentality, of mentality, other- man. Yes. And also, and I, you know, this might not be him. It may be him, but I honestly think oftentimes people use this as an excuse. Like, Oh, I can't be consistent unless I work out six days a week. Uh, you know, in my experience, that's not really true for most people. Maybe someone who's super advanced and fitness fanatic and they just love working out every day. But usually that's not the case. Usually if you can't be consistent three days a week, six days a week, you're going to be way less consistent. So, and I want to say that because somebody listening right now is like, yeah, that's me. It's like, okay, are you being honest with yourself? Because the reality is you just might be making excuses that sound better than I don't want to work out. It sounds better to say, well, if I can't work out a lot, then, you know, what's the I like the advice of going to the gym. I know for some people mentally, like having to get in your car and actually drive to a place and like ritualizing that whole process, like that's all part of their experience. So like, I get that, but to, you know, adjust and make sure that uh, that workout itself is benefiting you and recovering uh, in between your, your harder foundational workouts. Like that's the whole point of the trigger sessions. And it's, so it is, you know, it's a different shift of mindset going in, but there's no, there's nothing that says you can't just do that the entire time in the gym. Yeah. I I mean, I, I, I agree. I actually think that this is more common than you think. I think that a lot of people do well with just they that you commit 
This is my time, whether it be at five in the morning, like you do religiously every single day or in the afternoon or whatever, but you have this time. And I think where people get confused is that, or make a mistake is they think that every workout needs to be like this crazy intense workout. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's a very undulated. It's a very simple answer. I mean, here's a, I know we, we yeah, actually, can do something every day. I mean, he can literally just go walk for an hour. would be great. I mean, go to the gym every single day. If you want, if that, if that's what keeps you consistent, follow any of our programs that you're that you find or you like or is working for you and then if we don't have something scheduled a program walk go walk yeah. do stretching walk, session mobility stretch. do a sauna yeah, yeah. do a cold plunge there's a lot of things you can do that's for exactly your, what i would do your general health and so i'm not even going to try and, and and fight with somebody that's that is saying that as a reason why they, they're having a hard time with consistency fine okay then then go every day i like that just you know follow the program the way it's laid out and then the other days that you're in the gym yeah stretch or do mobility or do sauna it's, it's or just walk a, it's just in my experience when i've heard people say stuff like this like well if i can't have a perfect diet then i'm not gonna you know, <laughs> if i can't in my experience it's it's uh like you're yeah, not being honest with point? yourself yeah. it's like well the reason why I don't, it's like uh i have a buddy that didn't do jujitsu and his excuse this was literally his excuse i don't do jujitsu because you know I, I get mad and then i get really strong i don't want to hurt someone so like, yeah that's why you don't want to do jujitsu because you don't want to hurt sure all the black uh, you're, such a, nice, you're yeah. such a nice thoughtful guy that's the reason i mean the best I, the best i ever was as far as consistency was when i was going to the gym seven days a week and it just became a thing like it came like brushing my teeth it's like this hour of this part of the day that's i build I, I build everything else around that you know where what sometimes I think gets tricky, especially when you're kind of like in his place where you're you're trying to build that momentum and consistency, and you're and you're like, oh, I only need to train three days a week according to this program. Oh well, maybe I'll do it Monday. Yeah. Oh, you know what? Monday's kind of crazy on my schedule. I'll do it on Tuesday. You know, and you start playing no, that game. I get it, bro. But you're you're one in a billion. I mean, I, I've never trained a client like you. So in, in my twenty something years, and, and so I get what Are you're you saying. On him right now? No, I'm not. No, I get it. I get it. We're all like that, right? We all have an element of that, but that's so uncommon and yeah. rare. And we're talking to someone who just started working out, just got on TRT. They figured out the hormone level. So I I, I don't know. I, I would if I had to bet, I would bet. It was not that. It was more like, here's an excuse that sounds good. And I, I'm not being honest with myself. That's what I would say. Our next caller is Elle from Australia. Hey, Elle, how can we help you? Hi, guys. How are you? Good. How are you doing? Um, good, good. Bit starstruck, to be honest. <laughs> um, but firstly, just wanted to yeah. say thank you, guys, for everything that you do. Um, I, I find your information really helpful. So thanks for that. Thank you. Thank you. So my question was just around um, training legs in particular. So I've um, I've got ducks disease. I've got <laughs> long body, short legs, and I find it really hard to lean out my legs. And I've been told by sort of people at my gym, or oh, if you don't want your legs to get bigger, d don't train them. Um, and I feel like intuitively not training them um, isn't really the answer. So I guess my question is more around how to train them when I actually, um, you know, don't really want to train for hypertrophy given that that um, in itself means to get bigger and I actually want them to get leaner. Um, my upper body is really good. I'm really happy. I get lots of comments about my upper body um, but really struggle to with my legs. So I was just wanting some advice on really how to go about training them um, and what I should be doing with that in mind. Yeah, no, good question. This is a body sculpting question. So, um, so two things. One, Body fat uh, takes up uh, about one third more space than muscle. Okay. So as you get yeah. leaner, even if you were to, for example, if you were to gain four pounds of muscle in your legs, but lose four pounds of body fat, you would actually lose a third of the size on your legs because body fat takes right. up more space. So getting leaner would be the first thing I would focus on. I wouldn't want to, I would never tell someone to atrophy their legs. In other words, get your muscles to get smaller because now you're weaker, less stability. Um, that's not really a great direction to go. Now, if you want yeah. to avoid training in ways that could make your leg muscles grow, I would focus on mobility and athletic based training, multiplanar movements, single leg movements. I, I wouldn't train heavy, but rather more on technique, form and skill to keep them fit, right? You want to maintain the fitness, but you're not necessarily trying to push, you know, muscle size, right? Um, yeah. And then let me yeah. ask you, let me ask you this. This might sound like a personal question, but how balanced are your glutes to your lower, to your legs? Um, I feel like they're, they're probably balanced. My, my sort of, my glutes and my thighs are probably my chunkiest area. 
Um, so my legs, they look strong, um, but they're probably just a little bit of out of balance with my upper body because um, my upper body really responds well to training. So I have sort of, I can see my abs, I can see veins, um, you know, Got I have it. people sort of comment, um, you know, say things like I, I should compete. And so I'm really, really happy with how that responds. But I just find my glutes and my, my upper legs really lag and I just have trouble Mm. leaning them out and getting the definition yeah that's spot um, reduction. Them there's no balance. such thing as spot, yeah. there's no such thing as spot reduction else so yeah so yeah, yeah. as you get yeah. leaner your body's going to get leaner from the, the last place you get leaner is the first place that you store body fat so you got to keep pushing to get leaner before you start to notice the lower body um start to yeah. shred down a little bit did i ever did i ever share with you guys i don't know if i'd share with this on the podcast so, you know my um my ex Monique, she was a a female competitor, and um, this was actually one of the one of the issues uh, was she actually and she got so. First of all, I want to say what Sal said, which is the first step is to get as lean as you've ever been. So if you've never been down to like really really lean body fat percentage, I think that's the first step just to see and assess your physique from that point, because sometimes we just, uh, and we're all unique like this, where we store and hold body fat in different areas and longer. Like uh, the opposite is true sometimes where somebody is just, they got a higher body fat uh, on their upper body than their lower body. And it's the last place to go. Or a lot of times, a lot of guys are like that with their gut. Um, But anyways, when she did her show, obviously she was extremely lean. She got up there and that was the feedback from the judges. Her legs were too big. And so when we went back to the drawing board, as far as her training, the next like three months getting ready for the show, we did cut out a lot of leg training. And the only thing that we did really for her legs was uh, body weight lunges and hill sprints because we wanted to keep, you know, uh, the, the function and the strength as far as like her being able to move still well. So your, your idea of doing some like multi-planar type stuff and like athletic type, I think that's yeah. good advice. Um, and yeah. there's, there's nothing wrong. Listen, if you, if you have good, strong legs naturally, uh, and you know, you simply doing some body weight lunges and some hill sprints every once in a while keeps them muscular enough. Uh, there's nothing that says that you can't, you can't stop training them as frequent or that often. I mean, I do this with my arms now. I spent so much time developing my arms as a kid that they became one of my strengths. I, I can, I, a lot of times I won't even train them for a full month. And then I'll just touch yeah. them once or twice and they respond. And that's all I need to do to They're keep so big. To, it's a, it's and it's crazy. Ridiculous. Like I only have to train them uh, these days once or twice a month and they're significantly bigger than Sal's. Yeah. So, <laughs> it's, so if you have legs that are like this, where they're just developed and strong, like that was how Monique was. And so we just cut back dramatically on her lower body training. Mm-hmm. We did enough. So she, so we, I don't want her to lose function or not be able to, you know, do a single leg toe touch or run up a hill so you know do some things they keep and walking lunges i think that's uh, plenty fine and just cut back yeah. on, on the leg training. even like sled stuff yeah. lateral walking Anything functional and like i love that to advice because like yeah basically phase two of mass performance yeah is like a perfect fit for what you know you're you're talking about plus then too like it'll help to support the joints so you're not going to run into pain issues later which i always worry about um, you know, with competitors and, and the way that they're, you know, building up their body so much everywhere else, like you want everything to still function and support, um, you know, your joints properly. Yeah. And, and you said that your quads and glutes are the more powerful side. So then maybe the only other bit of leg training I'm doing is deadlift stuff. Yeah, good hamstrings, mo- good mornings, like, yeah. uh, uh, deadlift type yeah. of uh, movements. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we're not going to cut out legs completely. Just, I'm going to, I'm going to reprogram. We're not going to be doing a lot of, you know, we're going to do squats. We're not going to do Bulgarian split squat stuff. We're not going to do hack squat or leg extensions. I'm not going to do any of that shit yes. with you. I'm going to, our primary leg focus is going to be body weight lunges, maybe hill sprints. And then we're going to do, you know, deadlifts and, you know, laying leg curls and good morning. So you're still getting yep. leg training. We're just we're taking the focus off of the big muscle builders for the quads and the glutes because you don't need it. Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Thank you. All right. Mm-hmm. Perfect. And I'm, I'm also a, um, a horse rider. So that, you know, would complement that. So. Oh, that yeah. You get, you get a lot of leg work uh, riding a horse. Yeah. yeah. How often do you do that? Yeah. Uh, every day, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, so it makes sense now why your legs are so developed. You've been doing yeah. that for a long time? It makes a lot of sense. Yeah, all my life, pretty much. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I would go, yeah, I would yeah. go hypertrophy for the upper body, conditioning and athletics for the lower body, and you'll probably yeah. balance out the way you want. Yeah, that sounds perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome, uh, thanks all for right. calling in. Thank you very much. No problem. 
Now, in my experience, uh, nine out of 10 times, the person just needs to get leaner and they blame the size on muscle. But that one out of 10 times like you're talking about, yeah. that can happen. I've had maybe a few clients like that where that was actually, usually it's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah it's a handful. But when she pointed out that she's got veins in her stomach. Yeah, yeah. good point. She's probably, you right. know, she's not like a, a thick little girl that just needs to lose some body fat. Yeah, that's she's, a good point. If she's got veins in her upper body and getting compliments yeah, I had on this with a lady with her traps it just kept getting like super developed. And I so mean, like we had to adjust because of that. Monique so. was this. I mean, she yeah. got on stage. She took uh, second or third place at nationals. The reason why they told her she won, she said their her legs were overpowering yeah. her. And, and she She's got a good upper body too. She's, and the worst thing you could do yeah. is just stop training them and allow them to atrophy, which would, which is just so counter. Cause obviously look, you know, we're trainers first and I know people have aesthetic goals, but yeah. I can never recommend someone reduce their strength, mobility, and stability for the sake of looks. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. you want to work with your genetics. But yes. Yeah. There's definitely a way to do it. Yeah. Cause she, not- she could roll around in a wheelchair all the time and her legs well, will shrink. Well, sometimes too though. And we didn't get in enough uh, conversation with her. See, oh, well, probably the horseback riding has a lot to do with this. But like in like my case, the reason why I brought up the whole arms thing was not to, to pump my tires on my arms or anything, but was to <laughs> highlight. So we just use it as out. an opportunity to touch. Shit, yeah, so. right. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, what I really wanted to highlight was, you know, that's that that was from years of being the teenage boy who all he cared about was beach muscles and yeah. training so much volume around that that I did. I created an imbalance. I've got yeah. these overpowering arms. I had weak shoulders back then. I had no legs really, and so. You know, and it took me a long time to let it, let it go. Like, like, I don't need to train them really because I'm getting some of that work in all my, you know, compound yeah. lifts. And so that a lot of how I train now, I rarely touch them because of that. And so, and let me, you know, a lot of my female clients, women tend to love lower body stuff and they tend to avoid the upper body yep. stuff. So maybe for years she was focused more on lower body training and add in horseback riding and add in that she's, you know, not very tall. So it makes her look like she's even thicker that way. So, yeah, I mean, there's nothing wrong with, uh, you know, Did we she just call it Duck's disease. I've yeah. Never, never heard that. I thought she said Doug's disease. I thought no. she was doing, I thought that was a shot. I thought that was a shot at Doug. I was waiting for you guys to say something. No, Doug's very proportional. Yeah. yeah. Everything matches. I got Doug's that. disease. <laughs> it's a thing. I want Doug's disease. High testosterone, yeah. never age. Yeah. I'll take that one. Uh, yeah. Yeah. that was pretty good. Look, if you like our information, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any fitness or health goal. You can also find us all on social media. So Justin and Adam are on Instagram. Justin's at Mind Pump Justin. Adam is at Mind Pump Adam. And you can find me on Twitter at Mind Pump Sal.